University and I'd like to welcome you to the to the seminar. Um, first of all, I need to make everybody aware that we are going to be recording this webinar um, so people can catch up on it later on. Um, Les is going to go through his talk and thereafter there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end either by using the functions and raising your hand or typing in the Q&A box. So, um, without further ado today, the webinar is all around exploring emerging opportunities from the circular economy, which can help revitalise your business post-COVID. It's going to be led by uh, Les Bain, as you know, Managing Director of Scotland for Accenture. Now, Les is responsible for the growth and development of Accenture's business in Scotland, focused on building the Accenture brand in the region, bringing the best of their global expertise to customers, and bringing together an inclusive and diverse workforce capable of delivering innovation to their clients. Les himself has been with Accenture for 20 years and over this period has held a variety of roles. Most recently, he led Accenture's consulting business for comms, media and technology and is founder of their innovation programme as well as lead facilitator in Accenture's flagship innovation centre in London. So as you can see, Les has a, a very clear passion, shall we say, for innovation and driving breakthrough thinking with his clients. So it's with great pleasure that I now introduce Les and uh, hand over to him to take us through his talk. And as I say, there will be an opportunity for questions afterwards. Les, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Gail, for the uh, introduction and the opportunity to um, speak to everyone today. So, um, yeah, as um, Gail said, um, I've been in Accenture for uh, uh, 20 years, which uh, um, uh, is kind of quite a surprise given I, I started, um, like most people in, in Accenture, to just join them for two years. And um, 20 years later, I find myself, um, I find myself here. Um, before that, I worked um, uh, in various different jobs and roles. So uh, post um, uh, finishing at Napier, right? So uh, um, I was a Napier student who graduated um, back in 1991. So um, great to see um, university continuing and uh, in growing as well. And uh, I guess navigating COVID like uh, many other people, which I guess is somewhat the backdrop to the chat today, right? And um, maybe take about 20 minutes just to sort of talk through, um, you know, my point of view, our point of view, Accenture's point of view of what's happened and um, and what does it mean? So, um, Vlad, if you want to just progress to the next um, slide. Um, so, uh, just quickly ground us on a couple of things, right? So, um, What's just happened, right? Um, first off, I think we sort of witnessed um, like a major shift in um, uh, customer expectations, right? And the reason, so we always lead out on this is like customer first is the sort of mantra that we always think about. Um, but when you think about COVID, um, what's what's happened is um, COVID has um, sort of amplified. Um, this uh, economic necessity around different expectations and the uncertainty um, and the economic issue is actually driving customer expectations up, not down, right? Um, and why is that? Well, that's because um, in these environments, um, people need more value for money, their economic situation's worse, they want better service, better experience, better whatever. Um, so that's kind of going up and equally um, what's really interesting is the tolerance for effort is um, declining. So, uh, you know, I call it the COVID excuse, um, oh, we can't process this in time because um, of COVID. Well, that tolerance is sort of waning, right? And, you know, the, the COVID excuse um, will, you'll see that just diminish over time. Um, so that's a big shift that's happening. Um, changes and shift around um, uh, channels and how people communicate. So you know, I don't need to labour this too long, but you know the the advent of digital um, 
is not new, but has been massively amplified um, over this period in lots of different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, and if you really took time out to think about that, it's quite profound, um, the changes. Um, you know, a small anecdotal example, um, but a significant one would be if you look at doctors' surgeries, right? Um, for 10 years, 15 years, they have been trying to get doctors to do video calls with patients within, you know, three weeks. Most of them were up and running doing it right, and it's not going to go back. So there's this sort of profound shift um, around the sort of digital agenda that's happening. Ways of working is quite obvious. Um, you know, uh, while well, we're doing this now, um, I'm sure maybe in another environment we might have been doing it face to face. But the entire um, uh, disruption to how people work is going on. And then finally, um, there's this whole thing around operational agility and that if customer needs have changed, then um, businesses um, need to rethink and refocus around these needs, right? So if you think customer changes, needs change, operational delivery model needs to change to, to, to hit it. And if you click on to the next um, slide, then that sort of brings me to, I guess, a core part of what I wanted to speak about today, which was that um, uh, how are companies going to try and outmaneuver this uncertainty around them, right? And um, if you think about that, then there's a sort of anchor term that I use around, are you going to reopen or are you going to reinvent? And I've deliberately coined these two words because they are very, very different. Right? And companies need to ask themselves, is your intent um, to survive or is it to emerge stronger post-COVID? And what you tend to find around the world right now is a lot of narrative around the doom and gloom and everything else that goes with it. But actually, um, this is an opportunity to change, right? And what COVID's done is exposed weaknesses within companies, right? So, you know, if you think money's moving around the ecosystem, but the margins and profitability have not been that high. So cost structures have to be looked at. Um, you know, companies have got to think, are we in rapid remission or are we in continuous recession? Um, whichever way you're looking at it, um, you know, companies have got to think about building resilience and flexibility um, more than ever than they've done in the past. And, you know, fundamentally, that means there's a big shift around digital transformation, um, you know, not just um, transforming the operating model to, um, you know, grasp the entire experience and, you know, not just like taking physical and making it digital, but in, instead really thinking about purpose and experience required to be digital. So, you know, this concept of um, reinvention um, fundamentally is going to be the only way that companies are going to emerge stronger post-COVID, right? And the time is now, right? And this is another important point around um, the fact that, you know, if, you know, it's not like I'm going to think about it for the next six months and then I'm going to do something about it. It's about um, there's a very short window to move and, you know, obviously that window keeps on moving all the time, but, um, you know, companies need to make a statement very quickly um, to win market share. So what are the bold moves that the people are going to make? Um, you've got to think about innovation like you've never thought about it before and you've got to aggressively go after the market and show up as you want to be seen, right? which is better, fitter, and stronger, right? Um, rather than just, I'm surviving, right? Um, and then this whole point then about, well, what's the opportunity? And I'll, I'll talk about purpose in more detail in a second, but you know, this concept of showing up with a new sense of purpose, right? So COVID has given us an inflection point um, where companies can really think, well, what am I here to deliver, right? And, you know, there's evidence to suggest that companies that have already figured out their purpose can ride this wave much better than companies who perhaps have lost their purpose, right? Because when you've got purpose, 
then you can focus all of your talent around you focused on that purpose, even although your op model and cost structure are changing, right? And the, the, the kind of concept of that being that you align, you keep your purpose is your common goal, you get people around you, suppliers, partners, um, and you have clarity about why you exist, right? So there's an opportunity for companies who have perhaps lost their purpose to sort of reset it and think about how they're going to go on. And then inevitably you get down to cost investment and M&A, right? So, um, you know, the, the CFO arguably has never been a more important person in the business, um, but not for the old reasons, but for the new reasons, right? Which is, are you going to save money to present yourself as a lean business? Or are you going to save money to find investment to grow? They're two very different things, right? So I can skin my business down to be the leanest business I can be, or I can think about how I'm going to create um, cost capacity to create investment capacity to grow. So this important time for CFOs is to get the right governance around how you're going to reinvest money on innovation. Um, and it's a big, big job to, to try and figure out how that's going to be done. And M&A is um, arguably um, uh, one of the big levers for companies to grow, right? Again, there's evidence to suggest that acquiring businesses in downturns like we're in at the moment um, will have much higher returns on the future and also the asset prices are much more realistic. And all of this is happening now, right? So what you're seeing is this collaboration between large and small companies, business and consumer, business and society, and all the lines are blurred between these entities, right? But the fundamental fact is the seeds have been sown. So, you know, there's companies now who are doing things differently to what they've done before. So if you take, say, the telcos, the telcos would provide mobile services to small, medium-sized enterprises. Now the telcos, you know, Vodafone's partnering with Google to sell Google cloud platform to SMEs. Um, uh, telcos are collaborating with security providers to provide um, security products to SMEs. Why? Because SMEs are trying to digitize, survive, thrive. The big companies are now trying to line up against it, right? So all of this is, is happening now. And, you know, my, my part and show on, on this part of my talk is really to say that um, this change is happening around us. Um, the windows now, companies need to really think very carefully about how they want to show up and they need to do it deliberately and they need to do it with purpose, right? So challenge existing policies, processes, working practices, find new ways to, to work. Um, you know, these companies are not starting from square one, they're starting from square two, right? And they've got to build from that. And, you know, innovation is is like a, a sort of say, it's like a, a doing sport, not a talking sport. So it's about really, really challenging what you do today and doing it differently. If you just go to the next slide, Vlad. Um, so then purpose, right? So, uh, so I made a big deal about that in terms of, the change that's happening around it, right? So we have done, uh, we do like a regular global consumer survey every year, I've done it for the past 14 years. Um, I think you can find it on um, Accenture.com. It's, it's an interesting reading. Um, one of the most profound trends we found in the consumer research this year, right, was the rise of the purpose-led brand, right? Over 50% of consumers said that they would follow brands that stand for something. Now, that's quite a sort of profound shift, right? Over 50% of consumers said they would follow brands that stand for something. You, know, you could wind the clock back on this survey and probably that question uh, may not have even been answered or thought of um, many years ago, right? So. We know that companies that represent something bigger, communicate a purpose, demonstrate a commitment to that purpose, 
are more likely to attract consumers, influence purchasing decisions, and improve competitiveness, right? So then when you think about, well, how have these customer values changed? Well, consumers are at this tipping point. It's like a perfect storm, right? You've got political, social uncertainty, rise of social media, the shift between the human and the corporate, you know, the power shift that's happening there is changing, right? And what's really interesting, if you dig down, is each demographic has a different cause, right? So millennials, maybe a few on the call, um, you know, they're much more likely to take a stand on social, cultural, political issues that are close to their heart, whereas baby boomers are the people who are really leading the plastic revolution, right? And these trends are creating new tribes, right? that follow brands en masse and get connected with brands that are leading with a purpose. Now, how does purpose translate to profit, right? Everyone knows that acquiring and retaining customers is ultimately the key to profit. But when you think about um, if purpose is forming an intrinsic component of what customers are looking for in a brand, then you really need to understand the cause that resonates with them, and um, because that's going to be the thing that's going to drive your profitability, right? So, you know, in the survey, 55% of um, people said that their purchasing decisions were driven by ethical values and authenticity. 66% of people said demand, they, they, they wanted transparency in the company's sourcing of products, working conditions, and stance on important issues, right? So tuning into these changes in consumer behavior um, around purpose um, has a clear linkage to um, the profitability of a company. Now, when is this going to happen, right? So whether, you know, different industries are going to move at different paces, whether you're a B2B industry or a B2C industry, um, you know, the pace and the force is going to be different, but it's definitely coming, right? There's no, there's no escape from it that the concept of purpose is going to be much, much higher up on the agenda. And I think it's a theme you're going to sort of start to see play out um, quite prevalently in the next, um, you know, few months even, um, let alone a few years, right? And I think companies in today's situation, um, you know, candidly, you really need to work out when your time is up, yeah? So when is it that you're going to have to start to stand for something bigger? You know, determine what you're going to have to stand for, and that needs to be authentic, right? And that's a difficult thing. And prepare for the risk because there's unintended consequences of doing this, right? So if you link this back to reopen and reinvent, then you can say, will actually reopen or reinvent with a purpose because purpose seems to be the thing that people are going to notice and value in society going forward. Now, if we just click to the next slide, which brings me back to um, the circular economy point, right? Now, purpose is a very wide, um, uh, you know, I deliberately put it, put it down on the slide as one big word because it's a big word with a lot of meaning, right? One of the um, key purposes in life um, that is definitely, um, you know, more than in vogue, but um, is around circular economy. Now, I don't want to necessarily turn this into an educational talk about circular economy, but I do want to try and hit on a few things to help you um, then think about reopen, reinvent with a purpose slash circular economy, um, that there is a massive um, value opportunity for the world, um, for Scotland, um, to seize from embracing the principles of circular economy. I mean, I won't drain the slide, but it's, there's, there's real numbers behind it. Um, and if you click to the next slide, Vlad. So, uh, 
again, I you know I don't know how many people are tuned into the concept of circular economy, but in essence, um, the way that we um, uh, live our lives today in society around the take make waste model, yeah, um, where we you know source, manufacture, supply, you know use dispose of, um, it, it simply is not able to work long term, right? Because what's happening is that's using finite resources, it's generating waste. You know, you can be a believer or not a believer, but the reality of it is that that is not a, a long term sustainable way in which, um, you know, we can live our lives. And, you know, we, we talk about that as a linear system, right? Whereas the um, circular economy is a reflection of what we call a, a living system, right? Which is um, that we, um, you know, almost try and replicate the biological cycle um, in how we consume um, products, right? And, you know, again, um, you know, these slides, uh, you know, just try and articulate the cycle of the circular economy in a slightly different way, where um, uh, waste is is um, uh, you know almost taken out of the equation, right? Um, because of how we think about and how we design um, things, right? So, if you think about how um, uh, by rethinking how we sort of redesign products and components, we can. Um, get more value from them, we can generate less waste, we can reuse them, um, we don't have to throw away things, et cetera, et cetera. If you flick on again, Vlad, just to the, to the next slide. So, you know, the key principles of a circular economy, and again, keep on going back to reopen, reinvent with a purpose. You know, we design waste out of our business, right? Um, Materials are kept within one productive use for as long as possible, right? Good design, good technology. Um, you know, when products um, reach the end of the use, they'll look back into the system. So how do they get reused? How do we package up propositions rather than, you know, um, you know, I had a great example of um, uh, carpet tiles, right? Sounds like an odd thing to talk about, but, um, the company that, um, I can't remember the company's name, again, Modular Carpet, that was it. They now provide um, almost tiles as a service. Yeah, you know, the carpet tiles that go onto, onto the floor where um, rather than um, the organization owning the carpet, the carpet's put down, they effectively rent it and anything and repairs are made the carpet tiles are taken away and they recycle 98% of the carpet tiles back into the into the system, right? It's about smart design, smart sourcing, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you click on Vlad to the, to the next one. And, and, and I think this is a nice slide to think about, you know, again, reopen, reinvent with a purpose. So, you know, you, you can see the, um, the you know design source and you can see the cycle of how business works and what this slide does is is try and identify um, pockets of uh, reinvention right because that's all it is right I could take the circular economy topic off this and say actually just here are places where companies can reinvent how they do business what they do how they execute. And through that entire cycle, there's opportunities um, to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So just go to the last, the next one. I think this is the last one. So you know, ultimately, if I sort of tie it back together, you know, reopen, reinvent with a purpose. What does that mean? It means you know you need to challenge your operational business. You need to challenge the culture and organization that you've, you've put together. 
you know, you need to challenge how you think about the design and life cycle and use of your products and services. And, you know, you need to think about where you sit within the ecosystem. And that ultimately, I think, represents, um, I think what you're going to see, you know, in the next, you know, months, years is going to be companies using COVID as the catalyst to think about how am I going to reinvent my business? Where am I going to create the purpose? How am I going to embrace the circular economy? Um, because ultimately there is proof points that that leads to profitable growth. So pause there, 27 minutes. I don't know if I went too long, um, uh, Gail or Ron, but um, there you go. No, thank, thanks, Les. That's great. And um, we've got quite a few questions to, to kick off with, but um, one from Elaine, who is fortunate enough to be in a social enterprise, so has that sense of purpose to begin with. But she's asking, um, are there any tips on how you would uh, calculate the impacts to be able to demonstrate, as you're saying, that sense of or purpose to your uh, existing customers, new customers, and so on. How, how do you recommend uh, those impacts can be measured? Um, you know, start off with an easy question then, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't have a, a secret um, weapon. I'm just trying to think about how you measure purpose. Um, I would say a couple of things. One would be, I'd actually start with your employees before your customers, to be honest, because I think um, I think employees uh, can be much more tuned than you know. You think if you think about um, in, in Accenture, I'll just sort of try and use an Accenture analogy or you know comparative story, but. Um, the, the whole uh, Black Lives Matter movement happened, yeah? And um, naturally, like Accenture, like any company, is obviously trying to do its best to, 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 to manage these situations. And, um, but the, the, the leadership of the company um, like just embraced it like unbelievably well. Um, and, you know, they created this purpose around actually um, we want Accenture to um, lead out on and uh, be one of the, the, not like in a badge of honour sense, but in a sense that says we want Accenture to really, really, really um, set the bar on how, how we're going to do this. And they, if you kind of probably surveyed every employee in Accenture around our purpose around that topic, um, we are so connected with it. Um, from our leadership down. So I would say um, on purpose, I'd probably check in with your team, your employees and saying, right, are we clear on what our purpose is before we then check whether our customers are connected to it or not, right? Because I think your employees will know pretty well um, whether or not you're, you're, you've got a very clear purpose and that it's very clear to them and they're connected to it. and um, live it and breathe it. That's great. And uh, would you say um, you, you talked, Les, about you know it's got to be authentic. Your the sense of purpose. Um, so, how would you say that um, that statement of purpose would differ from traditional mission statements that a lot of organisations would already have? How would they have to? Reevaluate that to to make it an authentic purpose statement. Um, yeah, uh, good question. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, how would they reevaluate authenticity? Uh, you know, I don't want to go back to employees again, but again, I think it has to be real to them. Um, Not noticeable in people's behaviours. Uh, I think leadership have to live and breathe it, right? So, um, you know, I, I don't think you can stick 
lipstick on a pig unless the leader properly lives it and breathes it. Um, so I think the, 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 you know the, probably the checkpoint on authenticity would be actually the kind of quorum, you know, the inner sanctum of leadership um, is the test of whether they actually live it and breathe it. And below that, then what's the leading indicator of them doing that would be, you know, aside from how they act and how they behave, but also, you know, equally how they invest and how they line up to it. Ultimately, what targets they put on it, you know, so there's a sort of lineage that says, actually, how are we going to make this real? Um, which means that you've got to put um, real intention behind it. Not everything's a money game, but you've got to put real intention behind it, which, you know, I guess in business, a lot of it comes down to intention, investment, focus. You know, again, I go back to the, um, the example I used on the Black Lives Matter topic. And, you know, we just, you know, we started our financial year um, yesterday, our, our financial year runs from September to August. And, you know, day one, um, there's a whole intention around um, uh, training, retraining, and, and uh, you know, waves and waves of um, activity happening. I say, well, this is this is pretty damn real, right? Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question, but um, uh, and you know, I think people are not stupid, wrong either, right? You kind of know when something's authentic and not, right? So, I mean, that's another road test as well, right? Which is, are we just saying this for the sake of saying it, or are we actually walking the talk, right? Um, which I think, you know, again, the employees are going to have a have a good say on that one. Right? That's great. Um, you mentioned that the, the time window was short and that companies really need to, to address this now. And um, the big thing, I guess, with the circular economy and being authentic is that it's not just about how you as an individual operation operate, it's how your entire supply chain um, embodies what you're saying is your sense of purpose. So. Um, when you're doing this review, does it have to be that kind of, you know, go right back to the, the beginning, who, who are our suppliers, uh, get them to do the same uh, process of evaluation and come back to you? Um, is, and, and can that be done in a short time scale? How, how would you advocate that managers kind of look at that? I think the, the, the concept of the, the sort of time is now, um, this is quite funny, right? Because you know, I've I've spoken about this in lots of different shapes and guises over the past few months, right? And the time slot seems to be now all the time, right? And so sort of just you know, it's a tiny time slot, but we need to keep on you know, the time's moving on. So I think the time is now statement is is as much really about um now's not the time to procrastinate, right? Because what's happening is that um I think there's other people showing up. So if you're not on it and, and you're just watching everyone else, then you're sort of moving backwards. You just don't know it, right? Because there's other people getting ahead of you. So I think this sort of time is now is, um, you know, almost like, you know, if you planned a board retreat for, you know, Christmas time, then you're thinking about this on the wrong dimension. You've got to think about it today, right? Um, execution of that and optimizing supply chains and how whatever you decide to change and how you're going to change it is a little bit horses for courses in terms of the urgency and speed in which you can um you know drive these changes um but i think naturally if you sort of have that mindset that says, right, we need to really rethink and re-engage on how we're doing business, then, you know, that will drive your priorities. It will drive your priorities on your suppliers. It will drive your priorities on your people. Um, and I think that's the sort of reinvention thing. It's trying to focus on new things, new investments, new changes. You know, you have to go as quick as you can, right? Um, I think there's 
probably I mean there's probably lots of people on the call could talk about examples of companies and restaurants and I mean the restaurant industry, the food industry, um you know, I was listening to the radio the other day there and and you know obviously with the back of the um the eat out to help out scheme which has been I think a phenomenally great success. But what they were saying was actually um it's a bit a bit of a kick up the backside for restaurateurs and, and pub owners to think, well, actually, you guys need to be a lot more innovative now about how you're going to get people through your door. And they were using the examples of um, uh, restaurants in uh, France and in Spain and um, uh, Germany and, and mainland Europe were actually a lot more successful at getting people into their restaurants than UK restaurants have been in general, right? And they were putting it down to these restaurant owners in these countries were much more um, innovative about how they did that. Little set menus or, you know, down to people hustling on the streets or whatever it's going to be, it doesn't matter. But um, time is now, right? People have to move and, and, you know, I think if you wait around too long, then you're going to miss it. That's great, Les. Thank you. Scotland as well has a very strong existing social enterprise community um, with organisations like Social Investment Scotland and Social Enterprise Scotland you know, representing those groups. Um, and one of the questions is, you know, there's probably a, a lot of experience there that businesses could tap into and learn from um, and opportunities for greater collaborations between the social enterprise sector and in traditional commercial businesses. Do you do you think businesses are more open and more receptive to those opportunities already, or is there work to be done there to promote that? Um, I would say no, but they should be, right? This is back to my point, right? Which is, um, you know, you know, again, so go back to the reopen, reinvent thing, which is, um, I think, unfortunately, or whatever, it doesn't, whichever way you want to look at it, but I think a lot of people, um, big companies to small companies, I've spoken to lots of different people, there's a lot of people bemoaning the situation that they face, yeah? Oh, this is difficult, um, this is not fair, you know, whichever flavour of, um, you know, misery they want to pour on themselves, um, they look at it and they say, actually, this is difficult, this is challenging. Yeah. So then, you know, these companies are not going to be um, in, in not even close to a mindset of saying, actually, I'll engage with other parts of the ecosystem to figure this out. Yeah. So unfortunately, to answer your question, I'm not convinced that um, uh, there's enough companies ready to be much more open, much more collaborative, much more engaging. You know, they don't have all the answers. Um, and I don't, I, don't think it, I don't think it's there yet, right? And I think that's an opportunity for us all to try and influence, right? Are you aware of any existing networks that businesses could contact then to, you know, to look at potentially new suppliers or, or new partners that would help them become a more circular economy in their approach? There is, um, and it's just uh, the name. The name is, is funny because I was speaking to um, the. Uh, I was speaking to Edinburgh University. Oops, sorry. Yesterday, uh, <laughs> they're um, very in the interest of um, it's all out there. Um, they're they're creating a um, innovation centre around circular economy, um, and. Uh, I, I can follow up on the back of this. I don't know the name of the um, uh, the Scottish institution that they're working with as part of that, but that would be an obvious. Um, I, I don't think I've wrote it down in my notebook. I think I've got my notes on my email. Um, 
But there are people who are like there is a and you know if you think about circular economy and you think about COP twenty six and the the whole mood music that's kicking around around um, that theme, um, then you know there are enterprises. But this one in particular, I thought was one that was worthy of um, no, but I just can't remember the name of it. So sorry about that, but I'll I'll pass it back. That's great. No, we'll we'll pass that out afterwards. And I know that there's certainly a a hashtag circular Edinburgh, uh, which has a lot of organisations within the city that are uh, active in this area. So that's another one. Uh, we've got another question. I mean, on the circular economy thing, um, just playing around with that for a bit. Because um, I, I, I was, you know, I've always been a bit sort of schizophrenic on it in terms of how I thought about it, um, you know, because. <sighs> Are struggling to sort of wrestle the thing to the ground, if you see what I mean. Um, but if, if you almost took out the circular economy works, because sometimes they take you down a pathway that you're not convinced about, right? But in real simple terms, it's about taking a, a end to end cycle and saying, where can I make interventions and changes in this cycle. And the only thing I'm trying to put around it is a certain set of rules or frameworks around the circular economy part, if you see what I mean. It's no different to, you know, you know, Gail, when I was at Napier, we were we were doing like total quality management and process re-engineering and blah 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 blah. This is just re-engineering in 2020 in a context around sustainability, responsibility, purpose, these themes. So it's just changing, you know, like if you went through the timeline of when I was at uni to where I am now, and we've done, you know, just in time and MRP2 and, you know, more laterally automation and this and that, it's just trying to create a new set of rules and a new framework of how to deliver change. That's really what it comes down to. Um, ultimately, the net zero gate, net zero targets, and, and these things are targets to get to, but that's just through a process of engineering, yeah? And culture change, and mindset, and being open, and these types of things. So that's why I've sort of simplified it in my mind, is it's just re-engineering of processes with different rules, different mindsets. You know, that's all it is. Great. And we've got a comment, certainly in Edinburgh, the um, Circular Edinburgh is uh, supported through the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm sure other local chambers would be able to help. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a fair point. I mean, the Chambers, and you know, and equally Glasgow, and as usual in Scotland, um, is a massive sort of, uh, you know, everyone's doing something in one city or another. Um, but you're right, the Chambers are, are good sources of, um, you know, connection for that type of thing. Moving uh, slightly away from from that, there's a question. Um, the banks traditionally uh, would be a, a source for for funding to help businesses transition. And what could lenders do to to help facilitate that move to a circular economy? Do you see the banks leading or or lagging the charge at the moment? Um, I think. Uh... I'm not sure they're leading, but you know they're not lagging either, right? So I think um, there's more and more evidence of you know again, and like there's obviously different scales of investment, right? The sort of Scottish or National Investment Bank is is you know pretty much a purpose-driven bank in in, in Scotland, right? Um, and I think I don't think there should be problems getting money if you're if you're framing this around. If, let's just for, for this discussion, we'll call it circular economy. But if, if you're framing interventions and changes around these themes, I'd be very, very surprised if you find it difficult to get the funds to do it. Now, whether that takes the form of a grant or whether it takes the form of a loan or what other vehicle um, is a different matter, but I'd be very, very surprised if there's people struggling to get that type of money. Um, 
in the same way that um, anything that's investing around, you know, FEMA digital, digital skills, you know, these types of things, you know, I, I get a feeling, I'm, you know, I'm, people on the call will be in, in the in the ecosystem as well, but I get the feeling that these are, you know, companies are taking that with an open door. Now, getting money in COVID land um, is a different, you know, there's another layer on that then, isn't there? <laughs> right, you know, there's another qualification layer on that. Um, but, you know, let's not, you know, let, let's not let COVID get in the way of that discussion, right? But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, banks and stuff like that are gearing up to it, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I even, you know, in personal, uh, if you want to sort of, um, you know, work on your own personal carbon footprint, um, you know, I've seen all these examples about, um, you know, where you put your investments, you know, do you put your investments into um, circular bonds and all these other types of stuff? Um, so it's quite pervasive, I think. I think, you know, you, you shouldn't struggle to get money. Les, just related to that, can I ask a question? Do you think for companies to reinvent, whether it's around circular economy or, or just to do things better or to innovate, does that always require financial investment? Uh, I think it would be... No, I think... I don't necessarily think it's always big investment. Um, I mean, ultimately, it can be, but I think if you, again, you go through the layers of it, there's cultural change, mindset change, you know, you can make changes to process and activities that, um, you know, will require, I would think, modest amounts of investment. Now, whether that, you know, how far that takes you towards your sort of net zero outcome is, is, is a different matter, but I think the problem, let me reframe it another way, is I don't think money should go ahead of the intent, if you see what I mean. Because like anything in business, you know, if you sort of put money before the intention of what you're trying to do, you'll sort of never, never get it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have to sort of figure out, like I always say in Accenture, is like, you know, we're always looking for investment to take to clients and do things and all the rest of it. And I also sort of say to a lot of my guys, look, stop negotiating with yourself. Work out the game plan, work out the idea, think about how you're going to articulate a return on investment, put a good case together. People will give you money if, you, if you've got a good case for doing that, right? So um, I would be inclined to say, don't put money ahead of the problem put the problem ahead of the money and, and then work out how you're going to get it is my sort of sense of it, you know, um, yeah. There's, I guess as well, uh, one the example you gave in the, the circular economy model was the, the carpet company where they, yeah. they went from just supplying the carpet to having a long-term relationship where they would come in and replace yeah. and take away and, and recycle. and. I guess that's part of what businesses need to, to do is rethink their their actual cash flow model because if they can do this successfully, they end up with longer term relationships with their customers uh, that that will drive the bottom line. Yeah, and you know, again, uh, this is like sort of servit servitizing products, right? So um, you know, I remember when I was a, a young kid growing up. In Scotland, you know, people used to rent their televisions, right? Yeah. So they rent their TVs. Yeah. And you would pay money each month to have your TV. And then, you know, every two years you get a new TV, right? But if you go back to that cycle um, now, the, 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 the concept of the um, like servitizing it. Um, yeah, there are these benefits of customer engagement and, and uh, retention and all these other things, but um, the big part of it is then um, it's like a sort of zero waste cycle because if I, um, let's just take a TV for example, right? So, so we, you, know, you buy a TV, I mean, TVs now, you know, you 
could argue are almost practically disposable, right? I mean, you can get relatively cheap TVs, you can keep them for a few years and you get another one or you do this or you multiple TVs in a house. But if you um, bought them as a service, let's call it that, then the owner of the TV is getting the TV back and they are in control of the recycling of that TV, whether it's the recycling of the whole unit or the parts. So that ultimately, you know, if you just think in your circular economy narrative, um, the waste that's generated from that television is um, minimized because the owner of the television wants it back to take all the bits out of it and rebuild another one. Yeah. And the same way that the guy with the carpet tile is going, I'm going to take the carpet tile back and I've figured out as part of my process that I can um, reuse 98% of that carpet tile in a new carpet tile. So there's a sort of win-win through all that cycle. Customers happy, suppliers happy, environment's happy. So I think you will see um, you know, that more sort of servitizing, particularly as well with millennials, you know, like, you know, like old guys like me or even older guys like you, Ron, um, are, uh, um, we like to own things, yeah? We like to buy things. Um, but the um, generations coming through are less um, uh, taken with that, right? And you know, I think you'll see that change and that plays into the manufacturer's hands or supplier's hands. Uh, and again, plays back into the economic hands. And, you know, maybe, Maybe the millennials coming up are going, well, I'm not, I just, I'm not going to buy anything that's not going to be able to be recycled or used in a different way. And at that kind of corporate level, do you see evidence coming through that we're being asked here um, from procurement uh, as a function to actually drive this, or are they slow to the party? Procurement are slow to every party. Well, um, I think um, uh, a lot of procurement stuff, I think, starts off ticking boxes, right? Yeah, so they, um, but the strategic procurement stuff, I think, is different, right? If you see what I mean. So, um, you know, I've been a bit facetious with the procurement people, so apologies if I'm offending anyone that works in procurement. Um, but I think they play an important role, but like, um, I think procurement need to become more intelligent procurement. Yeah, if you see what I mean. Uh, because, you know, you, you know, again, maybe I'm saying the wrong thing here, but it's not just about price. Yeah. So there's a lot of components now in the decision making process about how we're going to source materials. Um, so I think. Uh, I think procurement could, should, would play a bigger role in it, um, but it needs to be a more um, intelligent procurement function that does that. And I know we're probably unblending procurement and supply chain, and and you know, naturally the sort of supply chain ecosystem is maybe a bit more different, but um, they do should play a bit bigger role in it. It's interesting, just linked to that, if I can jump in again, in my previous life, before I came to Napier, I was involved in a Scottish Government Task Force looking at procurement, particularly of IT projects and significant IT projects that had failed um, within sort of government, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds, etc, yeah. and hadn't achieved what they had to achieve. Um, and the biggest, well, the, the outcome of that task force was the simplest answer possible and it was the fact that procurement typically, as you say, often buy on price, but end up with a catalogue of bits yeah. rather than buying on outcomes. And it's how can we turn the whole cycle round so that we focus on the outcomes rather than the components. And it's yeah. a very difficult puzzle, I think, for procurement to fix. Yeah, and I think the big companies have a part to play because um, uh, we can be like a forcing function, right? Um, that. And I think this will happen. I mean, it's happening now and it will continue to happen, which is, you know, if the big companies set a stall out on a particular agenda, then that needs to flow down through the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So then 
you know, the pressure comes through the supply chain to, to react to that, right? So if you think about, you know, I can't have a purpose if I don't have everyone lined up to that, which doesn't mean just the people in my company, but I need, I need, I need to work with like-minded suppliers and partners who all share the same purpose, if you see what I mean. Um, so going back to the procurement people, that, that intelligent role of, yeah. you know, engaging with that, I think is important. Right? And that, that's been driven by the, those uh, big corporations with procurement functions and so on. With, within the Scottish economy, obviously, a huge number of small and micro organisations is is size an advantage there? Are they more nimble and able to just kind of react to this, you know, faster than than the larger companies? I think they, I think they should be, should be. But then I think it comes back to this, go back to this sort of mindset and the reopen, reinvent thing. That um, sometimes it's hard for a, a business owner to challenge the business that they have. Um, grown and developed for 10 years or 20 years or, or whatever. And sometimes it's quite hard. Um, and, it's not, you know, these people, not, not these stupid here, right? Not these, like, I mean, you, if you've got a successful business, you, you're the smartest person on earth, right? Because you've, you've, you've built it, you've created it. But sometimes it's really difficult to um, unpick it, right? Uh, so that's the conundrum. So, like, I hear like a load about, um, oh, uh, we're going to finance, we're going to do some financial restructuring, or we're going to get this cloud platform in, and we're going to do this, and we're good. But I, I sort of worry that everyone's doing all these things, but nobody's really changing anything. They're just doing it to the old business, where there's actually, how am I rethinking this? How am I really going to do it? So I think companies, naturally smaller companies, should have the agility to go and, you know, create a different view, to create a different purpose. But whether they've got all the mindset to do it um, on their board, you see what I mean? Like, you know, yeah, some, yeah. You know I, I heard, I was actually speaking to someone just before this call that, that was telling me that, um, I don't know where they got the evidence from, but uh, there was a lot of boards um, getting restructured, yeah, which actually isn't really that surprising, right? Because you know, let's say there's a, this company's sort of going into the sands, right? Mm -hmm. Why did they end up there? Because the the folks that were on the board weren't tuned in enough to think actually what am I investing in to create resilience in my business to do things differently. See what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, that'll be an interesting thing. You know, somebody do a, a count on how many non-exec board positions are coming up over the next one, two, five, ten months, right? As people need different talent to think about things. Um, I could see that happening quite a bit. That's great, Les. Thank you. I think we're pretty much up to our hour. So I guess um, just on that note, if I could ask you for a final thought. You, you started out by saying... Um, you know, this is about what people notice and value and, and finding that in your purpose. And it's not a cosmetic exercise to to appear one thing that's not authentic. Would would you have a final takeaway message then for um, listeners about that opportunity with the circular economy and this point in time? I would say that the the, the thing with the circular economy um, is that people obsess with the net zero target, which um, is um, difficult, right? Yeah. So my sort of view would be, uh, what are the changes um, that you can make towards that? Yeah. Like it doesn't all have to happen overnight, right? I don't know if anyone's read the book called um, Atomic Habits. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it, um, but have a read of it, right? Um, it's quite a clever book. It, it, you know, um, 
they talk about like an atom um, is a tiny, tiny thing, yeah? That's very, very powerful. And a habit is a repeatable um, activity. And the sort of concept is this atomic habits about actually the, the sum of the changes that you make will create the bigger outcome. And the, um, a, a habit only comes into form at a particular tipping point, yeah? So sometimes you've got to chip away at things before you get the thing that is the thing that people notice and value. So I think there's a quote about saying, if you watch the stonemason chip away a piece of rock and nothing's happening, but on the 101st hit, a piece of rock comes off. It wasn't the last piece of rock that took it off. It was the 100 hits before it that took it off. So I sort of say that you can't consume this thing in one go. You just have to get on the path, mindset, what are you going to do? What's the right timings? At some point, you'll create a tipping point and market the hell out of that tipping point because you've earned the right to get it. Great. Atomic Habits is a good book. It's a good book. Okay, is that us coming to the end? So I just, I really want to thank you, Les, very, very much for taking the time to do, to do the webinar today. It's been really interesting, obviously from your perspective and obviously all the good work that Accenture is doing to, to bring innovation to us all up here in Scotland. Really appreciate Indeed. it. And I think from, from a business school perspective, it's great to feed this knowledge and expertise into our classroom as well, which we certainly will do. And, and hopefully there's a part that we can play not only with I guess developing the the future leaders to think about these things, but also working with businesses in the here and now to help shape their thinking and support them where we can as well. So it's been very useful. So thank you so much. Really appreciate thanks. it. Thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks, Gail, for the opportunity. So uh, um, I'm sure we'll reconnect soon. We will do. Okay. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye.